and welcome to the third webinar in the webinar series hosted by RNR Law Chambers. In today's webinar, we thought of taking a break from discussing purely technical issues of law and focusing on something which every lawyer practicing before a court aims to master. So today's topic is mastering the art of reading briefs and structuring your arguments. And to help us decode this art, we are privileged to have senior advocate Mr. Akhil Sibal with us today who will be answering some of the burning questions which all of us litigating lawyers usually have. In terms of the format for today's webinar, we have compiled a broad framework of questions which we will be taking up with Mr. Sibyl. And as always, if there are any questions from the participants, please send it to us through the Q&A tab in your app. And time permitting, we will endeavor to take up those questions in the end. So without further ado, I uh, I request my colleague Roman to start the session. Thank you, Rina, for that. And uh, thank you, Mr. Sibyl, for joining us today. A uh, little bit of personal touch on this is that uh, the real reason why we're having this session is because a few days back, I believe, you had given a talk on the art of advocacy. And both Rina and I intently watched that and are big fans of uh, the process in which you described the whole advocacy in detail, which inspired us to in fact have this session and understand what goes behind the art of advocacy. And thank you so much again, sir, for coming. So I will just put up the questions on the screen and then we can begin. The first question and the context is as plain as it can be. What do we do when the first time you receive a brief from a firm, what are the basic parameters that you check off before you start opening and reading the file? Firstly, thank you, Rina, and thank you, Rohan, for organizing this interaction. Welcome to all of you. I hope you find it useful. So the first thing you need to ensure is that the brief is complete. In particular, I check to see that the order sheet is complete. Remember, the order sheet is the only record of the history of the case. In some other jurisdictions, the proceedings are transcribed. So you have a more complete record. But that's not the case with us. There have been some judges in the Delhi High Court who would uh, dictate a note at the end of each proceeding in the counsel's presence, which would capture the arguments made. But that note wouldn't form part of the order and it wasn't a formal part of the file. It was only, it only served as an aid memoir for the judge for the next time so that he could recall what transpired, what arguments were made, uh, what issues remain to be considered. Uh, I recall Justice uh, Sudarshan Mishra, for instance, uh, doing this, and I felt it was quite useful. Um, so all the judge has in our system in terms of what's happened in the case uh, is the order sheet. And so it's essential that you have, you have the complete order sheet as well. Often a briefing lawyer says to me, when I find that some order is missing, oh, nothing happened on those dates. Uh, the matter was simply adjourned. But I always insist that the missing orders are provided for two reasons. One, the solicitor's recollection may be imperfect. Possibly the matter was adjourned but there could be some observation in the order. The lawyer has probably never seen the order. So it's hard for him to really be sure, even though he tells you he's sure and he sounds very sure. Second, the order might reflect at whose instance the matter was adjourned. And that could become important in arguments. So if I have the complete order sheet, I can count the number of times the matter has been adjourned, either at the instance of the court, or one of the parties, and then use that to oppose further adjournments. So that's just one example of why having all the orders is important. And I would urge you not to compromise on the complete history of the case. I also check to make sure that I have the complete pagination as per the court's file. Your file must always mirror what the court has. Otherwise, you'll never be on the same page as the court. And that's a disaster. It's best to check this as soon as you get the file. 
so that if there's still some time before the matter is next listed, you can request the briefing lawyer to get the pagination. Beyond that, I check that the file is complete in other respects. At times, the briefing lawyer will assure you that the file is complete, but it's possible that something has been filed by the other side, particularly if it's recent. We all wake up just when the matter is uh, about to be listed. So it's possible that just before the next date, the other side files something and the briefing advocate doesn't have a copy because it was sent by post or served on the client or for some other reason. So a good way to double check and get ahead of this is to look at the Delhi High Court website and the case history, which will reflect filings. It won't give you all the details, but enough to figure out if you might be missing something and then the briefing lawyer, you can bring it to her attention and she can make further inquiries. So this is the first exercise I undertake before I launch into reading the file, which is to ensure that it's complete in all respects, because once you embark on this course of an in incomplete file, then you tend to flounder in court. There are things which you are not aware of. There are things which are missing and being having a complete file is the best way to be prepared. Of course, this is the same approach, whether it's the original side or the appellate side. Thank you, Mr. Sibyl, for that. We are sure to keep our files complete from now on. Moving on to the next question. I think so, we've covered the next question, um, but I would still ask you this, is the approach different whether you're a plaintiff, petitioner, appellant, or whether you're a defendant or respondent? Yeah, so the approach is essentially the same. Order sheet, pagination, complete file. That's always important, no matter which side you represent. But, but with an appeal, there's an additional element. And therefore, this is a good question. Often, the record of the court in the first instance is voluminous especially if the impugned order is a final judgment post trial. So in appeal, the entire record is not placed. And usually there's an application for calling for the entire record. But it's possible that as a counsel, you feel that parts of the record may be required even at the first hearing, which have perhaps not been filed. There's no straitjacket formula for identifying what part will be required. It all depends on the facts and the argument that you need to make. So one useful guide though is the impugned judgment. Generally, I would look to see if the material that the impugned judgment refers to is filed with the appeal. That's a good rule of thumb to again, get ahead of that lacuna quickly to identify quickly that something is missing and to, you know, then get those papers and perhaps file them. This problem arises frequently, I found, with Section 34 petitions, where the challenge is to an arbitral award. The arbitral record tends to be heavy, so most people don't file the entire record. They're racing against time. There's a strict limitation. One day on the wrong side of limitation and you're out. Uh, scanning everything in perfect order, it's a challenge. So the difficulty is that uh, a Section 34 petition, and this makes it a peculiar difficulty, is not a statutory appeal, as we all know. Very often, the court therefore hears the matter extensively on day one and decides either to issue notice or dismiss. Sometimes the other side comes on day one and says, I don't need to file any reply. I'm ready to argue. Finally, please hear it. My money is stuck and so on. And uh, judges uh, are fairly proactive in the Delhi High Court in particular, I found, in, in hearing them at the admission stage. So the day one preparation in a section 34 challenge has to be particularly thorough as if you're going to argue finally. And for that, if the relevant record is missing, then you can face a handicap in court. So you have to be particularly vigilant. Otherwise, uh, as I said, the approach is broadly the same. Thank you, sir, for that. Now, speaking of voluminous documents and especially in the case of 
the example you gave about section 34, which is the first document that you will gaze your eyes on in the realm of this voluminous record, both from an original side perspective and from an appellate side? And then what comes after that? Now, on the original side, the first document I read, and I would encourage that approach, is the pleadings of the parties. Because that's really the foundation of the case. A lot of your argument and the arguments you face from the other side uh, require you to have an intimate knowledge of the pleadings because uh, you, know, you can immediately raise an objection where required that that argument, argument doesn't have a foundation and so on. Um, sometimes the judge will inquire whether the argument you're making uh, has the proper foundation in the pleadings and uh, you need to be on top of it. So that's where I start. And um, uh, uh, you know, the place to discover the starting point of the case of the parties is the pleadings. I read the pleadings carefully. Then after that, I look at the relevant documents. On the appellate side, by contrast, there's an impugned judgment that's under challenge. So that's a good logical place to start. Um, it will give you a sense of the case of the parties because generally the judgment will reflect at least some part, if not the complete part of the arguments uh, that were canvassed. And the impugned judgment is probably what the judge reads first as well. So in an SLP, for instance, um, you can take it that typically the judges would have read the impugned judgment and your synopsis in the SLP. Beyond that, they may not have read much else. Um, so after looking at the impugned judgment, uh, I look at the documents referred in the impugned judgment. And uh, significantly, I look at the grounds of appeal last. So the first instinct probably would be to start at the very beginning of the file with the appeal and go through you know, the grounds of appeal. But I leave that to the last uh, because I want to have formulated my own thoughts on the matter before I look at how the case has been, appeal has been cast. And that's a good way to be unencumbered by the grounds of appeal and think in the first instance independently of the brief and then look at how uh, the case has been presented in the appeal. So just a follow up question. I think we've all understood the approach here, but would we still stick to the same approach when we are pressed hard for time? Let's say the matter comes to you right in the evening at 8 p.m. and then the matter is listed tomorrow. How do we manage to check all these boxes for the hearing tomorrow? Yeah, so you're right that there has to be a prioritization. I will almost never go to court uh, in, a, in a suit not having looked at the pleadings. I might read them with a little less care. Over time, you begin to understand where the different parts in the plaint are likely to be. You know where the jurisdiction para is. You know where the cause of action para is going to be. So you're able at a glance and by flipping through, you're able to identify the key sort of averments and components. And so you know where to focus. You also know that there will be some uh, part of the pleadings which are repetitive in nature. You can easily identify them. You know that there are standard bits that will come like in an, a matter dealing with intellectual property rights, you're going to have a para on how it also amounts to unfair competition and you're going to have certain standard paras. So the minute you hit those standard paras, you know to skip those because you know that that's not going to have the critical part of the uh, case. But to go into court merely on the basis of a note that your junior has prepared, for instance, uh, you know, overnight telling you what the case is about without having read some part of the pleadings is a very risky proposition. I would not recommend it, even if it means, you know, waking up in the wee hours to read parts of it, you should do that. Obviously, you know, you can divide the labor if you have a team with you uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, organizing the documents for you. Uh, so my juniors will help 
with you know useful flags so i know where to go and a note and i'll come up, uh, i'll come to that a little more uh, later as well uh, so you can divide the labor but looking at pleadings in a suit for instance is essential similarly in an appeal you cannot avoid reading the impugned judgment line by line as far as the entire appeal is concerned you need not read that you can go to you know run through the list of facts you can uh, go to the grounds of appeal briefly and get a sense our indian style of pleadings tends to be repetitive we don't uh, favor lean precise focused pleadings uh, the approach tends to be you know that it's not a problem saying more it's a problem saying less so therefore unfortunately we are burdened with very very lengthy uh, and unwieldy pleadings but over time you can you do figure out uh, what the different moving parts are and you can go straight away to those and and sort of you know uh, look at those quickly and absorb them quicker thank you so much for that sir i think you've answered this question but let me rephrase this question with a bit of a twist when you have the impugned order and just a while back you spoke about having an unencumbered approach does that mean when you're reading the impugned order for the first time you would prefer a dispassionate eye to it or would you factor in who the bench is in terms of the matter so so i as i said earlier that with an appeal i will not first read the grounds of appeal i'll go straight to the impugned judgment what that means is that i don't uh, have impugned findings in mind when i'm reading the impugned judgment and again the reason for that is to remain as unencumbered as possible so that you know my own thoughts form something jumps out at me so i i would read the impugned judgment without the uh, you know the the weight of how the appellant has cast the appeal but with a critical eye right so when i read it i will be asking myself look how convincing does this logic sound you know uh, are there weaknesses possible weaknesses that i can notice you know is there a logical misstep or is there some lacuna in the sort of reasoning so so those are my first reactions and based on that i would then go to the documents that the judgment relies on to the material that the judgment relies on and have a quick look at some of those documents again to see if my first instincts about you know what might be the weaknesses in the order are good ones and so i will refine my thoughts a little more and then i'll go to the grounds of appeal and take those into account uh, you know and perhaps read some other parts of the appeal the facts in more detail and then formulate uh, you know my final most refined version of uh, the arguments which of course remains a work in progress as you look up case law as you have a briefing as you think about it over time so the idea is to start forming a view quickly immediately have a reaction allow yourself to have a reaction have a thought don't don't worry about that uh, reaction being off the mark or that thought you know or of revising that thought later to course correct you must learn to have that active engagement with what you're reading and i'm going to talk about that uh, perhaps a little later as you ask me uh, further on the process but that's how i i i would read it and as far as the bench is concerned uh, look that of course when you come to how you're going to uh, place your argument and how you're going to uh, present it in court that's going to be something that uh, that uh, is relevant and i think we'll discuss that as we go along Oh, thank you so much for that, sir. So, when we talk about uh, the reading methodology, while answering the previous question, I, 
I think we did stumble upon the idea of skimming and scanning certain portions of the brief when there's positive time. And that perhaps answers this question. But sir, can you throw some light on what are the chances, or what are the things one can really miss when we don't follow a line by line approach and we tend to speed read? Yeah. So, so in, I, I, I can share with you that in the early years, I would make it a point to read the brief line by line, cover to cover. Of course, there was more time. Uh, there were far fewer cases, so it was possible. It requires a lot of hard work, a lot of uh, commitment, but I would recommend doing that. And I'll, I'll explain to you why that's important and how it worked for me in my favor in the earlier, earlier years. So if you've read everything, then you are ahead of the game to some extent because there'll be many others who are involved in the matter other than perhaps the person who drafted the pleadings uh, who have not read everything. So you may be in your capacity as a junior counsel, as a briefing advocate, briefed by the solicitor, having an exchange and a discussion with a senior counsel. Uh, and, and when making your contribution, if you've read everything, then it's possible for you to pick up on less obvious points because the bigger, more obvious points are things which others would have picked up on. But if you've read everything line by line, cover to cover, then over time, things will start jumping out at you, which are a little more obscure and may could turn out to be critical. So because of this rigor that I would practice, I recall that there would be times in the meeting, uh, you know, with your super seniors of that time where, you know, I would make some sort of obscure point based on some fact that I had read with which others had missed. And at times it was shot down and other times, you know, there was a very positive reaction, but over time, therefore, the others began to realize that here is a young lawyer who reads his brief very carefully and he's coming up with new points, different points. He's thinking. So therefore I think without that reading, your ability to be original, to find something that others have missed uh, is, you know, diminished. Uh, and, and so therefore that's one advantage in the earlier years. The second uh, is that, uh, or another thought that strikes me is that uh, uh, as a disadvantage is that, uh, you know, in the course of the hearing, there are factual questions which arise. The uh, court could ask you a question. The other side makes some argument which has some factual reference in the file. Now, it's impossible for you to anticipate all of those questions that will arise. But if you have the foundation of that reading, then as and when an unanticipated question arises, because you've read the file, you can answer it in a way that nobody else can. But if you start your preparation with a truncated version of the file, with a note prepared by somebody else, then at every step you're being guided by what you think or what somebody else thinks may or may not be important in court. And when that unpredictable element uh, you know, arises, which it does more often than not, then you are caught, you know, wrong footed because you don't have that foundation because you've not read the file cover to cover. Now, this is not to say that that is practical or feasible, um, you know, for all times to come as you progress in your career, as you know, the workload increases, as it becomes, you know, impossible to allocate that kind of time then obviously, as I discussed earlier, uh, you'll have to be selective and prioritize. But by that time, you'll also have become better at knowing where to look, how to look, and what to look for, and being able to skim. So the problem is that if you start skimming and skipping 
at the very beginning, then you develop the bad habit and you don't figure out the, you are not able to sift and differentiate between what's important and what's not important. But if you do it thoroughly to begin with, then over time, you can refine that, uh, you know, that reading and make it more efficient. Oh, that's really helpful, sir. And, and the question, the reason why this question is there, because I think I struggle a lot with this. So it was more of a personal question. I hope you um, found it helpful. Yes, sir. So now, sir, this question is something which has intrigued me. I remember the talk you gave some time back. And if I've quoted your expression correctly, actively reading a case brief, that really jumped out to me. And I remember you had mentioned that when you're reading, you have to ask your questions in your mind as to where is the brief taking you, form an impression, keep guessing where the story evolves. So I wanted you to elaborate on this method and how to make it easy for us practitioners, how we can read and at the same time ask these questions to ourselves. Yeah, so it, you know, it is a little difficult to explain because it's a bit abstract, but I cannot emphasize enough the importance of actively reading, as I call it. Um, so let me give it a go and see if uh, th this helps to explain what I'm talking about. Um, so imagine you, you're watching a movie, right? And you're, you're sitting in the cinema hall and your, your, all your senses are, are flooded, you know, with sound and image and colors and so on. And you, you know, it's like surrendering yourself. You sink back into your seat and you sort of surrender yourself. You relax for the duration and you allow yourself to be absorbed into the movie, right? So you allow the story, the images to wash over you. You allow your emotions to naturally unfold. And once the movie is over, and that sort of, uh, you know, the impact on your senses is lessened and you've walked out, then you start reflecting about the movie. You think about it. You think about what aspects spoke to you. Uh, you know, you think about the emotions you felt. You think about the characters. You discuss it with your friends, right? So what, the way I would describe it is that you're passive in a sense while watching the movie and you're active after the movie when you're thinking about it. So while reading a brief, you should not be passive the way you are when you're watching a movie, allowing the information to just be absorbed without actually thinking critically about what, what you're reading while you're reading it. So in other words, you should be thinking as you go along. But it's more than that. You should... Uh, Think critically as you read and try to anticipate and imagine what factual and legal issues might arise even before you've read the facts and seen the legal issue as described in the brief. So uh, I'll tell you what I do. Um, I'll, you know, call up a junior telephonically. The file will have come, uh, you know, to the office. The junior has gone through the file, maybe not thoroughly, but Perhaps briefly, it's just come, uh, you know, a couple of hours ago. And I will telephonically ask the junior on my way home, say, from the end of the court day, um, that, look, just uh, give me a sense. What's this matter about? And my junior will give me a basic sense of the matter. Now, I've not seen the file. I've not had a briefing yet. The junior also has not given me a very detailed description. But based on the little bit that I have, um, and perhaps those kinds of cases that I have done before, I'll use my past experience and knowledge of the kinds of issues that arise in matters like this to imagine what could be some of the facts that I would be looking for on behalf of the plaintiff, uh, some of the questions that I need to be asking. Uh, and wondering how the facts actually play out in the case. And I'll allow myself that little bit of a, a sort of imaginative reverie 
in order to get the juices flowing. And the importance of that is that you then start to develop an angle, a critical angle, a prism, right? With which to look at the brief when you ultimately end up opening it. And when you open it, you already have something in your mind about what you, where you think this matter, matter could go. What could be the possible points? And as you read, you will sort of amend and modify and modulate those points. You may find that something you thought uh, you know, could be there and should be there and would have been helpful if it were there is not there or there's something which negates it. And so you modify your argument. So that's a way to get yourself sort of thinking about it in advance and uh, sort of predicting in a sense. And it's amazing uh, how uh, you know, that helps over time to, uh, you know, to train your brain to ask precisely the right questions, to look for exactly the right issue. And it will seem effortless to you, you know, you'll go to a, a super seniors uh, council's chamber and, you know, he or she will ask something that nobody has thought of. And you'll wonder, how come, you know, this person is so laser sharp? You know, why does he have such an eagle eye? How does he know that that's the thing to ask and that's the relevant fact? And it's because the brain is functioning in that way where everything that you know the person reads is with this critical eye in an active way and over time therefore develops that skill uh, to look through precisely the right prism but if you you know start thinking about the brief after you've read it then what happens is that you not only do you not by the end of it have a well formulated argument you've missed a lot of stuff because, stuff, because facts and issues only jump out at you and settle in your mind if you're looking at them from a critical angle. Because without that, with no sort of framework for thought, it's just facts that you are reading, but you won't be able to recall them. This critical angle becomes a sort of mnemonic, a memory trigger for recalling that relevant fact just when you need it. So let me give you an example. I don't know how sort of illustrative it will be, but let's say there's a dispute over contractual dues. In the narration of facts, uh, you read that on X date, a particular amount became due to the contractor. Now, even before you proceed with that narration, you should be thinking, I wonder if the contractor communicated with the employer in some way, did he write a letter to point out that, look here, this is the amount due. And I wonder how soon after it became due, did uh, you know, the contractor write to the employer? Now, you've not yet read the next fact. You don't know what's coming, but already your mind is thinking along those lines. That's an angle, right? Now, very possibly the next fact in the narration will be precisely that the contractor wrote to the employer on Y date asking for the payment. But because you've asked yourself that question before you actually read the next fact, you will immediately absorb how long after the amount became due, it took the contractor to write. Was it immediately after or after some delay? If there was a delay, you'll ask yourself, I wonder why there was a delay of, of 21 days. And if the narration on the other hand doesn't reflect such a communication, then again, this aspect will lodge in your mind that, oh, hold on. This doesn't tell me about when the contractor wrote to the employer asking for the payment. And then you might later seek a clarification from the instructing ad advocate. Now, at this point, you don't know because you're just going through a narration of facts whether this element of delay is relevant or not relevant. But you're already thinking that, okay, it might be relevant. And the extent of delay has already lodged in your mind. So when you come later to the file, maybe there's an impugned judgment later, and you find that actually delay was an issue, you will immediately be able to recall straight away the extent of the delay. Because when you were reading that fact, you were reading it actively and not passively. So, 
uh, uh, to sum up, it's important to formulate a critical angle as you read. Think about what facts you hope to find in order to be able to make a particular argument and then see if those facts emerge as you read. Think about the argument you could make even before you've read all the facts. As you read and discover the facts, you'll modify, you'll adjust your argument to fit the facts. And at the end of it, you're likely to have a far more precise and well-formulated argument as compared to if you sat down with the brief, read everything, and then started thinking about what arguments might work. So I, I, hope, I hope that helps. I know it's a little bit uh, obstruse and abstract. No, sir, thank you, sir. That's indeed a very interesting approach. I just have a small follow-up question on that. Uh, do you think that uh, when we are uh, engaging in actively reading and thinking about issues before we actually proceed to read the file, especially in case of appellate proceedings, as you said that when you are reading impugned judgment, so you have to first read it from a dispassionate eye. Do you think there's some risk of dichotomy between the two approaches when you are already thinking about the issues before you go ahead with the judgment? Yeah, so so you're right that it sort of could require you to dial back. But I have found over time that what it teaches you is to be fiercely independent in your thought. And that is the major challenge when reading briefs that are already prepared, when proceeding to uh, consider appeals which are, you know, follow a trial, follow a previous round of proceedings. It's already put together. And as a counsel, of course, you are part of what you're doing is arguing the brief as it's prepared. But certainly a very major part of what you're doing and what's going to set you apart from the others is what new you can bring to the table. And that novel element that fresh perspective, that out of the box thinking cannot come unless you learn to think fiercely, constantly, and, uh, you know, uh, with, with complete independence. And what this method helps you to do is to develop that in independence, because though I understand and your point is well made, that it can lead to a degree of mental confusion because you start off with something uh, on your own uh, without the benefit of the relevant facts and then suddenly you're faced with the relevant facts and it may uh, you know, completely upset what you were thinking. Well, what happens is that over time, your first instinct and thought becomes better because the minute that those facts as they actually exist and perhaps the impugned judgment and so on upsets your framework, you absorb and wonder why your framework to begin with was not as good as it could have been. And over time, your ability to predict the inflection point, to know where to look for that needle in the haystack becomes far more sort of laser sharp. And you are able to segment it and separate it in your brain. So initially it's confusing, but unless you do it, consider the, the flip side. If you don't do this and you first read everything that somebody else has prepared, then the ability and the resistance your brain faces in thinking independently is far greater because you've just read somebody else's perspective. And that perspective is weighing on you. And so therefore, to think on your own is much more difficult because you're already feeling encumbered. So I think this is the better way because you start off unencumbered and then you face that encumbrance with a critical eye versus you start off encumbered and then try to be independent, which is far more difficult. Absolutely, sir. And in fact, I will spend about 20 seconds more in trying to create a takeaway out of this question, because I think this is a very nuanced approach and all our participants would want to understand fully how to implement this. 
So, sir, from what I hear is when we are reading the brief, and in order to develop a critical angle, one must ask these uh, basic questions as to what, when, where, how, and perhaps why, as we go along the brief. But then the question arises: Are we supposed to follow this method just on facts as they are pleaded, or also when we are flipping through dockets and dockets of documents? Yeah. So, so obviously, this is primarily to think about both the facts and a similar approach as far as the legal issues that would arise. Uh, the exercise of the documents and as you say often voluminous documents um, when looking at them if you develop this habit of asking the right question then your ability to home in on those documents out of the mass that would be relevant is far more effective. So you look at the index, you'll get a sense of what is the cluster of documents, what is the nature of documents. And because your mind is questioning, when you go to those documents, again, it's not going to be with this passive eye of let me look at all these documents, then close the file and think to myself, did anything jump out at me? When you're looking at that document, you're already going to be looking for something. So if, if I could put it in the simplest way possible, I would say you must at all times when reading, whether facts, whether law, whether documents, be looking for something, right? Imagine that you need to find something, something in your favor, something against you. Have a thought, formulate an angle. It may be the wrong angle. But the fact that you have an angle will allow you to recognize and absorb that relevant fact, that relevant uh, feature of the document, that relevant point of law. Thank you, uh, sir, for that. Um, now let's move on to the next question. What all goes into, or actually from your perspective, what all do you require? so that you have a full satisfaction that you've prepared your brief is so, it list of dates sorry go ahead sir yeah so so as you say list of dates case laws note of arguments i still believe that there's no real substitute for reading the brief yourself no matter how many notes are made by others you're never going to be as effective with your preparation unless you've read it yourself. Uh, because chances are that those who are making the notes for you are uh, you know, folks with lesser experience who may not spot and have the ability because of that lack of experience to see some of the things that you yourself can see because you've had better practice at it. So therefore, if you depend on a junior's notes and don't read for yourself, you're not going to be as prepared as you can be given your ability. So I try to as much as possible read as much as I can. It's not always possible and therefore you have to have some shortcuts. And uh, that depends really on the nature of the case. I try to depend on my own notes, which are not very extensive. They are most more in the nature of markers which are supposed to trigger a thought in my mind rather than detailed recitations of the argument or uh, you know formulations of the argument and so on i try to depend on my notes rather than any uh, anybody else's and i still even now despite you know a much heavier workload try to reread the file every time the matter is listed now, I fi find that to be invaluable. Uh, and what happens if you have a script already prepared in terms of a prepared note, which is very detailed, is that whenever the matter is listed, you're going to be lazy and just look at that. But if you don't, then you are compelled to read the file again because you don't have enough notes uh, you know, to prepare you. 
And when you reread the file, something new strikes you every time. There's some new angle, you discover new points. And so, you know, I don't want to deprive myself or the client of that fresh perspective, which could arise. And so I try to reread. Having said that, look, I do rely on notes, um, usually with regard to documents, where they are, nature of documents, referencing them. And I, we do, uh, my juniors do prepare based on, based on propositions of fact or law, uh, those documents in a sort of indexed way so that in court, I can know exactly where they are. So that's more, I would say, for referencing where the relevant material is in the file, rather than depending on notes for the formulation of my argument. I try to structure it in my mind. I re re revisit it, rehearse it, prepare it again every time that it's listed. And I feel that that keeps me sharp. But I need to confess that, um, you know, I'm, I, I think in future, I will have to start to depend more on notes because, you know, it's becoming a, a little uh, onerous. Um, there are some other things, you know, just by way of preparation that I'm particular about. Uh, for instance, just as an example, uh, you know, uh, I often find that I'll go to court and the copy that I have of the judgment is uh, different from the copy that the solicitor has and with further copies for the court. So those are things which I'm, I try to be organized about so there's less confusion. Um, and so we do coordinate on, on judgments with the briefing lawyer to make sure we have the same copies and so on. I cannot again emphasize enough the importance of logistics. If you as a counsel believe that others are going to take care of the nitty gritty of the photocopies of the you know, uh, pages being clear of the pagination, et cetera, et cetera. And you don't cast a critical eye over all those aspects yourself, then you're going to find yourself handicapped in court. Uh, every component is essential. It only works, the team only works if everybody is playing their part. And you as a supervisor, in a sense, as the captain of the ship, need to work with the briefing council to make sure that all that happens and you need to keep each other on your toes. Coming to the role of a briefing council, I think in the last answer you did cover some portion of what is to be expected. But are we looking at something in particular from a briefing council other than the assistance and the logistical part of it? So I as a matter of policy, make my best endeavor to read at least some portion of the file before the briefing. So chances are I will not be totally at sea about the basic facts. I'll have a basic sense of the matter. Even if time doesn't permit for me to read the file, I would have made an attempt to connect with one of my juniors who's had a little more time and get a sense of the matter. The reason is that I want to make the briefing as productive as possible. And for me, the productivity of the briefing means to elicit from the briefing lawyer, what are my best points and what are the best points against me? So I don't like to take a whole lot of time in the briefing in sort of a vertical approach of starting with the basic facts being taken through the documents and then ending with a discussion on the issues. I want to get as quickly as possible to the critical part so that we can have an exchange and I can, you know, test the arguments along with the other members of the team. So I am happiest when the briefing lawyer comes and instead of telling me, please read this page and please read that page and then I'll make my point, says to me, please don't read anything. Let me tell you what I think are our best points and let me tell you what I think are our, is our major weakness. And then we work on that backwards by going back to the facts, back to the file, back to the documents. To be honest, sir, we've been guilty of committing this practice, but now on we'll try and make sure we start it backwards. Okay, we've touched upon this aspect, sir, and I think this is the core of any practitioner. How do we bring out 
original thinking of value add on something which has already gone through many people's eyes so my answer will be a little bit overlapping i have touched on some of these aspects but um, again uh, you're right that this is of critical importance so it's worth revisiting a little bit the best way to think independently of the brief and that's the challenge is to reconsider the case from the beginning rather than being bound by what has happened or what points have been taken i'll i'll give you from a when and how i learned to do this i remember in the early years um you know i just started out i had not joined any chamber i had precious little work and i was concerned and i asked my i went to my father and i said look um you know can you recommend uh, somebody some senior that i can do a couple of matters with you know to learn the ropes and to learn how to think about these things and without hesitation my father said i'm going to call up you know mr ram jeet malani and request him to involve you in a matter and he involved me and then independently in my own right over the years i had the privilege of attending conferences and i still remember we would all be sitting there quietly and he would be reading and reading and very carefully reading his file and then suddenly he'd ask a question um you know that sort of was entirely different from the case as presented in the file we had read the file so we knew uh, a point that had not been raised that had not been argued and our instinct was to say you know me included that sir instead of answering the point but sir uh, you know uh, we've not raised this point and he his answer was always the same look where before the supreme court it makes no difference what point you've raised or not raised you leave that worry to me you please answer the point and that's how i learned to think uh, you know independently of the brief and not worry so much about what's been raised what's not been raised and since then i've always tried to uh, distance myself from the way that the case has been presented i go back if i can and time permits and for young lawyers time does permit uh, and so you must do this i try to go back to the beginning i sometimes do it even now if i have time i revisit the basics and i build up the case as if i were putting it together for the first time as if the client had come to me to file and i think about it all over again and it is cumbersome but the more you do this the greater your ability to you know think of something out of the box and then when you come across a point that's not been taken then you worry about whether you can take it whether you can't take it whether you can amend the pleadings whether it's a pure point of law and then you find law which says pure points of law can be taken at any point and so on and so forth sometimes you'll find it's a dead end you're bound by your pleadings and you can't take the point but the key is to develop the habit to to perfect the method to allow your mind that freedom so it by instinct operates with that fierce independence thank you sir for that and uh, one last question before we end the first segment this is more about your case load management not many of us face this <laughs> so to be honest this is targeted at uh, someone at your level of course who's has to handle multiple matters in a day so how do you do it sir is there a mental cap somewhere when you say this is it not beyond five matters not beyond six or 10 so there's no fixed number but i do consciously think about and try to not take up more matters than i can handle and do justice to i you know at a personal level i feel very uncomfortable with myself if i go into court not having uh, been able to spend the kind of time that i feel i require with the brief you know i it just it makes me a bit anxious i am not as cool about it as many others who are you know perhaps better at winging it and uh, you know smoother operators than me 
but at a at a personal level i feel you know that i'm not doing justice to my matter and to my commitment and so therefore i will say no uh, saying no is a difficult thing um you know uh, many lawyers tell me how do you say no i learned to say no early i was clear about it i was categorical and once people understand that uh, they respect you for it um there will be those who complain but you know you can't please everyone and if you end up pleasing the next guy you're going to disappoint the previous guy so you have to be a little uh, strict about it or at least i choose to be um the reason there's no number is because it depends on how heavy uh, the matters are which you've taken on and what they're coming up for now this doesn't mean that i don't prioritize i do have to prioritize and uh, i think about how significant is the hearing for a particular matter uh, on a particular day versus another case and based on that i would sort of give a little bit of priority to one over the other i'll also think about how uh, you know uh, how able is according to me the briefing council in being able to perhaps manage in my absence that's a relevant factor i think about how long is the hearing likely to take uh, you know so that's a relevant factor at times about managing your time and uh, the goal ultimately is always every day the same you want to attend as many matters as possible and cause the least amount of damage by missing a matter um i will sort of uh, uh, on a closing <clears throat> note on this just add that i make a particular effort not to miss pro bono matters uh, which i do do from time to time uh, and the reason is that i am extra conscious that the briefing advocate and the litigant may feel that i didn't give the matter priority because i wasn't earning a fee and generally those are matters where the client and the lawyer need me more and so therefore i try to attend those over other matters thank you sir you've left us with a noble thought now i hand over the next part of the session to my colleague rina who's been patiently waiting and indicating that we are running short of time <laughs> uh, thank you sure. rina for that uh, over to you sir. thank you rohan and thank you sir for detailing your thoughts on this i think all of us got something new to think about in terms of mastering the brief in today's session now coming to the second part of structuring arguments my first question to you would be once you have gone through the entire brief what is your first process of building up your arguments is there a preferred style of arguments that you would like to follow the preferred style where you would say i would take up those issues first in a given matter so there's no straight jacket formula that i follow but if there are preliminary objections in the nature of jurisdictional objections or perhaps some other maintainability objections then i will place those first uh, because they potentially offer a knockout punch or um, at times when the case is weak on merits then preliminary objections can help uh, to deflect attention and to delay the consideration on merits at times so strategically uh, you know uh, preliminary objections can be a useful starting point as for the merits i follow the approach of trying to put across my point of argument as quickly as possible uh, no doubt the stronger stronger points will receive priority what i try to actively avoid is a detailed narration of facts before i get to the point um now obviously i don't know how carefully the judge has read the matter it's possible that i find as i am uh, you know uh, making my argument that i need to revert to the facts um uh, in order to bring the judge up to speed but my starting point preferably is not to tell the judge you know these are the facts and and then proceed sequentially uh, as you would in sort of you know writing a brief 
where you proceed with the facts and then the points of law it's, and so on and so forth. I don't, I wouldn't proceed in my arguments like that. I can always go back to the facts to support my point, but I don't want the judge getting impatient, wondering what my argument is. The sooner the judge knows what the argument is, the sooner she can start thinking about it. And then the facts as you place them have a context. Dehorse the argument, the judge can't appreciate why you're focusing on certain facts and not others. So I try to make the point at the outset and the detailing should come after. Yes, sir. Now taking cue from your answer that you do not place the facts sequentially, comes the next question. How do you, in a typical case, tie each of your facts to your case laws and to your arguments? How do you do that? So, um, as I said, uh, you know, you if you don't start with the point that you want to make, you might find the judge sort of getting impatient and cutting you short. Um, it's best, therefore, to reference the facts and the law to each point. It makes the arguments more cohesive. Otherwise, you run the risk of your arguments becoming disjointed. So the greatest impact is if you make the point, show the relevant facts and support it with the applicable law. Now, one aspect I want to spend a little bit of time on uh, because I found that it's not something that um, is easily appreciated and I feel it's of some importance. You need to think and learn to think in terms of propositions of fact and law. So a fact, and I know this sounds a bit rudimentary, but just bear with me. A fact is a statement of something that has occurred. A proposition of fact, on the other hand, is a factual inference that you wish to derive from the fact. It's the point you want to make in respect of that fact. So he wrote to her on 10th July and she responded to him on 20th July, are statements of fact. But she responded to him after a delay of 10 days is a proposition of fact. It has an underlying fact, but it's a proposition of fact. It's a fact bundled with an argument. You can support that proposition by providing proof of the facts, namely copies of the letter of 10th July and the response of 20th July. Similarly, a proposition of law, and this is of course easier, much easier to understand, is the point of law. So for instance, that she waived her right to object. It is actually a mixed question of fact and law. Now in support, you'll cite judgments on waiver, which would be the law in support of the proposition of law. So the propositions are arguments and the facts and law are the support for the arguments. So I first present the propositions of fact and law and then proceed to tie in the facts and law with those propositions. It's not relevant to tell the judge that look, in the first instance, he wrote on 10th July and she responded on 20th July. What you need to tell the judge is look, there was a delay of 10 days in responding or there was an inordinate delay of in responding and then build backwards to the facts that inordinate delay was 20 days, one month, six months and so on and so forth. So the proposition is how you need to think, articulate, and argue. And what I find that people tend to do when they argue, and what I find that briefing counsel do when they brief, and in both cases, I would recommend you know, uh, presenting in terms of propositions, is that they'll submit facts rather than placing propositions of fact. So uh, again, I would strongly recommend thinking and arguing in propositions of fact and law rather than facts and law. I hope that's not too confusing. No, no, definitely not, sir. Now, sir, coming to the argument stage, in one of your previous talks, I remember you mentioned that 
you prefer building the other side's case first and then demolishing it argument by argument can you please help us understand this approach better yeah so uh, we discussed earlier thinking beyond and independently of the brief and not being bound strictly by the case as presented in the brief now just as you try to do that with your side of the arguments any good counsel does so is the other counsel doing that with her side of the arguments so if you confine yourself to thinking about what the other side's position is by looking at the brief and saying oh well this is what the other side's position is look it's set out in this brief and not independently of that then you will not anticipate what could be the best points against you including those which are independent of the brief which the other counsel is working actively to ferret out and think about just as you are doing with your side of the argument so therefore don't worry about what plea or argument has been taken by the other side so far think about what the other side might take build that up right and the advantage you will then have is that you are not going to be caught unawares in court with that unpredictable out of the box independent point you will have already thought about it you will also know beforehand that that point is not taken in pleading so you will be able to raise the objection as well the idea is to make your experience in court as we try to do in life as predictable as possible we are dealing with myriad myriad variables right anything can play out differently based on a change in a variable from what you how you thought it would play out your attempt is to forecast right as best as you can and in order to do that you must test, test the strength of your own argument not based on what the briefing counsel is telling you based on what she thinks is you know the other side's argument but based on your own independent thought having built up the argument of the other side as if you had accepted the opposite side's brief and then uh, dealing with it answering it and refining your argument to make it its best version of itself that's how you can be extra prepared and the best prepared beyond what you are sort of told by the briefing lawyer sure sir now sir talking about testing the strengths of your own arguments you would realize that in every case you have some strong arguments and some weak points so what is your strategy while putting your case before the court do you argue all your points or do you leave out the weaker points so i do consider dropping the weak points it depends really on how weak they are if you combine good arguments with bad ones then what tends to happen is that it detracts from the overall strength of your case and reduces the credibility of your stronger arguments so it's a mistake and people often make this mistake of thinking that look my strong argument will you know be segmented and separated from my weaker argument and i'll make all of them and the judge will be able to distinguish between them and chalo if the weaker argument doesn't find find favor it will be rejected and it will not damage my stronger argument that's wrong because the way that the mind works and the way that a judge absorbs the impact of what you say is based on the overall impact and if you sneak in terrible arguments with stronger ones then the judge gets the feeling that you know you're not a very credible counsel and you're arguing things that are unconvincing and starts to doubt your better points with you which you argued with much greater conviction so remember time is limited in courts it's best to be selective focus on the winnable arguments if i'm convinced by the strength of some of the arguments then i'm more inclined to drop the weak ones but but i also take the approach that if my stronger arguments are not that much better then i might think about including even the weaker ones hoping that one of them will stick so it depends 
But otherwise, if I have good, strong arguments that I've convinced by, then I say to myself, well, if I'm not going to win on those, then I'm likely to lose anyway. So there's no point. Thank you, sir. That was very helpful. Now, for the next question, you have already covered it a bit. But when you talked about structuring your arguments, but when it comes to opening submissions, I would again like to ask you, do you have a preferred style to present your opening submissions and how much would that style vary depending on the bench that you are facing? So, uh, again, my preferred style is to get the judge thinking immediately. I try to formulate the points that are in a manner that are most likely to grab the judge's attention and make her feel that there's something in the matter that requires consideration. You need to pique interest. And remember, the judge will have come possibly with some preconceived uh, you know, approach, maybe against you. So you need to try to present it at the outset immediately uh, you know, in a manner that gets the judge interested and, and allows the judge uh, you know, to, to hear you further and encourages the, a little more patience in the judge. The judge may then say, okay, what I thought about the matter, let me just leave that aside for the time being. This sounds interesting. Let me see where he's going with this. So un until you do that, the judge will be distracted and possibly try to derail you. So you need to think of something that will appeal to a judicial mind and conscience. And you need to state that at the outset. Then wait, work your way into more detail. Now for that, you need to be able to put yourself in the shoes of the judge and think about what would appeal. If you're too caught up in the case that the brief reflects or that your briefing advocate wants you to argue, you're gonna miss the mark. You may have a good argument, but as a counsel, you need to think about how to present it in a way that's appealing. So for instance, you might suggest grave injustice in some particular way, or you might hint that you know this matter has wider ramifications. You need a big picture beginning. The trailer needs to captivate the attention of the judge. My personal style though, uh, is not to make an overly dramatic beginning, but a focused and pointed one. Some counsel are far more theatrical and uh, th that can yield results because sometimes the judge uh, you know, takes a step back and says, well, you know, if this, if this counsel is saying it with such vehemence and such theater, then maybe, maybe there's you know, some legitimate conviction behind this. So let me you know, hear that counsel out a little further. That's not how I uh, like to start, but that's a bit of a matter of personal uh, and preferred style. Sure, sir. Now, sir, apart from the judges, most often we also know the opposing counsel that we are facing. And it ever so happens that uh, each counsel also has a certain style of arguing and presenting his arguments. Now, how much does that factor into your preparation while structuring your arguments? So, um, you know, one doesn't always know who the opposing counsel is going to be until perhaps just before the matter. So I don't really structure my arguments when I'm preparing depending on the opposing counsel style of argument. But having said that, if I know who the opposing counsel is in advance, I'll factor that into the kind of arguments I can expect from the other side. So I do think about the opposing, opposing counsel style, strengths and weaknesses, and I modulate my style accordingly. Uh, as an example, if there's, say, a very senior, you know, counsel on the other side with, you know, 30, 40 years at the bar, uh, who commands a certain additional regard with the bench, uh, and justifiably so, I may be more considered about my interruptions. My tone and tenor might vary because I'll know that, look, if I am as aggressive as I might be, you know, with... Uh, another counsel of more equal standing in that sense, um, you know, then the judge is, is going to take it otherwise and not appreciate it. Um, you know, it, it's a natural reaction. So I will be careful about that. 
and in terms of court craft i'll be conscious therefore about who's appearing on the other side um you know uh, over time you understand what um, tricks certain counsel have up their sleeve what their styles are you know how you know uh, how carefully they've read or not read and so you get better at sort of gauging your opponents in that sense and you you know play to your strengths and play to their weaknesses yes sir now the next question sir this is something that i personally also struggle with a lot now in india especially sir most of the arbitral tribunals comprise of retired judges from high courts and supreme courts so does your preparation method differ when it comes to arbitrations or is it the same process you follow which you follow during your court preparations so uh, my preparation method and structuring varies only to the extent that the pressure of time is far less when it comes to uh, arbitration in before a tribunal versus uh, in court so that initial burst which you at times require in court to capture and sustain the judge's attention is generally not required before a tribunal there's greater patience in hearing arguments and you can take your time to construct your arguments far more methodically take your time over them whereas in a court scenario you need to be far more selective and strategic about what you say because the judge is only going to hear you so much and then possibly push off the matter and that's not that's not always the case but it often is so you know that uh, need to be selective to be strategic is far greater and your ability to patiently methodically structure your argument and take the tribunal through it is far sort of easier before a tribunal yes sir thank you that that was helpful now the next couple of questions sir are in the nature of general questions that we thought of asking you now it happens a lot that in one matter multiple councils get engaged and we have also engaged multiple councils in various matters now does your style of preparation whether it comes to preparing the brief or structuring your arguments does that differ when you are engaged as a second counsel in a matter so the preparation is at two levels one in case the counsel leading the charge is absent i need to be prepared with the whole matter so in that sense there is no difference uh, now the second counsel briefs as you know can be of two kinds uh, one for the same party in which case again there is no difference in preparation because i have to be as prepared as i would be if i'm uh, leading the charge the other is where the cause is the same or similar but for a different party you are on the same side there's no conflict you're supporting each other but there's a different party and there may be a slight difference uh, you know in the legal position now in that case as a second counsel part of the team overall team i have an independent right of audience so i try to find an additional point that i feel the counsel leading may not focus on or i try to develop one or two points more substantially the idea is to add value and to avoid repeating the arguments so one has to be a little more strategic if you if i relate this back to what i was saying about being a young uh, you know counsel early days and reading the file cover to cover the idea was at that time to find something which others have not found to find the less obvious points and therefore i would read everything very carefully and try to add value and distinguish myself frankly um and in the process help the case by finding that slightly more obscure but important point so as a second counsel also i will prepare fully but i'll also keep in mind that look um there will be somebody perhaps who will lead the charge cover the basics cover the obvious points so i might get my office working my juniors discussing with me slightly more uh, refined points or obscure points or perhaps developing with in greater detail the more obvious points and that's how i try to add that thank you sir 
Now coming to the next question. Now you have already touched upon this in your previous previous responses also, but just wanted to again check with you. Apart from time constraints that you now face because of multiple briefs that you are getting, has your method of preparation changed when compared to your earlier days, both in terms of reading the brief and arguing? So I would say. on balance that my method of preparation hasn't substantially changed there are some tasks of preparing notes that i am able to now effectively delegate to juniors that briefing council sort of uh, assist me with which i earlier prepared myself also i don't look up case law myself anymore and that that is uh, in a sense a change um, in terms of what i spend my time on uh i discuss what i do is that i discuss propositions of law with my juniors um and then they pull out the case law and we sort of keep revisiting and refining that other than that over time i'd say i've become better at knowing what to look for and where to look for it i've become more adept at asking the right questions so reading and decoding the brief is far easier it moves far far more quickly and uh, although there's always an element of unpredictability you just become better at anticipating the questions from the bench and the points that might be raised by the other side so for instance when a brief of a suit comes to me one of the first questions i'll automatically ask myself is how is jurisdiction made out i don't even have to think it just automatically the question pops into my head and i'll know exactly where in the plane to look uh, for that and to figure it out so you learn over time it becomes second nature you stop thinking about it it's like you know when you start you learned how to drive your brain had to think about you know how to move the gear from one to the other and now that you know how to drive you just don't think about it it becomes instinct it becomes second nature but for to develop that instinct you must have the right method if your method is bad that instinct will never uh, uh, you know uh, form it will never take hold and it's a then a lifelong you know disadvantage and i must share with you very candidly uh, a lot of the people who uh, you know do join my office um, who have years of experience uh, i often finds that i that i have to make them unlearn Uh, a, a great many things that you know they've learned they've they've fallen into into bad habits and this is why it's important right at the beginning to think about what method you're fo- uh, following train your brain to work in a particular way and that's you know a uh, uh, a lifelong advantage as for the change in approach to the bench uh, you know in the early days uh, i must share with you uh, i had plenty of time i hadn't joined anybody so i had very few cases and i would um be perhaps less social than i ought to have been uh, and go from one courtroom to the next and i would spend hours just sitting and observing others arguing i would observe the judge very carefully i try to figure out what is the judge's personality i have always focused on that i you know courtroom personality of the judge is very important to me and to my practice and i structure my arguments informed by that composition of the bench you can ask my juniors the first thing i ask them is who is the matter before even before i know anything about the matter um you know over time uh, you understand that certain aspects matter more before a particular bench some benches some judges have certain intellectual social leanings some policy views look we're in the business of persuading people and if you don't have if you don't think about the personality of those people then you're not going to be very good at persuasion you can't have a one size fits all approach some judges are particular about observing decorum others are less bothered some read their files more than others so there are differences of a small a scale and of a larger scale and you must be aware of those um and modulate at least i try to your argument and your court craft and your court strategy based on that yes sir 
thank you sir for giving us a lot of pointers today and just to wrap up this segment is there any other advice that you think you have left out for your younger colleagues at the bar so you know there's there's a lot more that i could kind of dilate on but it'll have to wait for you know another occasion and more time we've all already sort of uh, run well beyond the the clock so let me just focus on a couple of things um there is of course no substitute for extreme hard work but beyond that you're going to need courage you're going to need perseverance you will feel disheartened at times i feel disheartened now perhaps you'll feel disheartened often there are many disappointments but i assure you there's a lot of meaningful and fulfilling work you can do if you stay the course you need to learn to take charge think independently and lead from the front don't be overly dependent on other people's views and advice they'll try to you know win in with um uh you know best intentions at heart advise you this way and that way but you need to ask yourself whether it sounds right and go with your gut your instinct you will get it wrong but you will develop that correct instinct over time if you simply follow somebody else's lead all the time you're never going to uh, learn for yourself sometimes you'll sense a short term advantage but in the long run it might lead to a disadvantage so be careful about your reputation and about your credibility with the court in terms of arguing your preparation should be such that you can argue your case completely without asking the judge to open the brief that's very challenging but you can do it and that's how you must try to do it you should only need to take the judge through the brief to make good your argument not to make your argument you should be able to orally state all the necessary propositions of fact and law without opening a single page if you can do that you will be far ahead in the game thank you thank you sir that was indeed very engaging and i think we have already run out of time but we'll just take up one question from the participants rohan will you please take up a question thank you reena and thank you sir although we've received a plenitude of questions i will confine this last segment to just one question sir and perhaps this borders on a bit about the art of advocacy as well as the structuring of arguments how much as a counsel are you willing to concede on the weak points before a judge so you know i i'll tell you a struggle that one faces and in the council you face that um which is that your client is you know has a perspective about the matter um the briefing advocate is uh you know careful about ensuring that the client's perspective gets put across ultimately the briefing advocate doesn't want the client to go away and so there are many times when as a counsel you are pushed by the briefing advocate and the client to urge the matter in a particular way right and you know that look this is not the best approach for the matter you know that this point which uh, you know is being uh, emphasized is a is on the weaker side but your briefing advocate is terribly convinced because the client is terribly convinced right so you have to you know take the time to explain delicately you know to the client to the briefing advocate why you don't recommend it and ultimately you have to take a position right so there are times when i have you know explained it and folks have understood and we're all on the same page um there are times when they've haven't and at times i've withdrawn from the brief 
the I, the point is that as a council what you must do and what your briefing advocate doesn't tend to do because of the uh, the pulls and pushes of you know the client is put yourself objectively in the judge's shoes ask yourself if you were a judge would this point appeal right does it prick your conscience does it you know strike you as you know a, a, a good point to do justice don't just you know flog it because you're convinced so that's one now that is something which is an approach you take before you commence your arguments but there's another uh, difficulty or another scenario you face which is you actually are convinced of the strength of a particular point you canvass it and you realize that the judge is thoroughly unconvinced so what you thought was a strong point in the mind of the judge is a weak point now what do you do then you have to have as a counsel the flexibility and you need to be able to think think quickly enough on your feet to dial back to course correct to abandon an argument which is not finding favor and getting you no, nowhere if you just keep at it like a drill no matter what you know without being sort of aware and conscious and cognizant of the fact that it is making no impact on the judge you will end up just derailing the case and getting nowhere so at times like that you have to recalibrate in court and shift right your focus from one argument to another albeit that that other argument you felt was the weaker one so it's quite a dynamic process thank you so much sir for that valuable insight into how to master brief and structure arguments i think uh, we, and with your permission we can close this session and uh, on a lighter note i must confess that like uh, Arena and myself, there are about more than 250 people who are equally fans of yours, and you might get more applications <laughs> for juniors after this session. But thank you, sir, for taking out time uh, for us and uh, being so candid about all of this. We don't really get to hear much from our seniors at times, and in this lockdown, more than ever, this knowledge is immensely helpful. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your. enthusiasm your support your great questions and thank you for giving me the opportunity and i think giving everyone else the opportunity and you're right you know unfortunately um you know these are conversations that uh, you, you know i do have with my juniors and they're probably sick of hearing what i have to say on these aspects but it's nice to be able to reach a wider audience um yes i have now you know been uh, in the profession for a while and uh, you know i i i you know try not to feel as old as i am becoming but i still remember vividly um what it was like to be starting off and you know what were the fears that i faced how i overcame them and i want to be able to share you know these experiences while those memories are still vivid with me so thank you for giving me that opportunity